This question is about the reaction between sodium thiosulfate solution and hydrochloric acid. When hydrochloric acid is added to sodium thiosulfate solution, the mixture gradually becomes cloudy. And you might recognize the names of those chemicals. These are the chemicals that you mix together in the disappearing cross experiment. You mix them together, you start the timer, and gradually a cross, which is placed underneath the conical flask, is no longer visible to the observer looking down through the contents of the flask. The equation for the reaction is shown here. We've got sodium thiosulfate on the left-hand side, reacting with hydrochloric acid, making sodium chloride, water, sulfur dioxide, and sulfur. And we've been given the state symbols for each of them. Sulfur is produced in the reaction. Why does this mixture become cloudy? Well, they've told us about the sulfur, and sulfur has got a little S in brackets after it. These are the state symbols for all of the chemicals in the reaction. And the state symbol S means solid. And so that means that the sulfur has been produced as a solid or as a precipitate or insoluble substance. And it's actually the presence of that creamy coloured sulphur that obscures the cross from underneath the container because the sulphur is opaque and we can't see through it. The other state symbols, by the way, liquid water, sulphur dioxide is a gas, and then the other three chemicals are aqueous, which means they are dissolved in water. And then we've shown a diagram for how they're setting up this experiment. It's a bit different to the normal disappearing cross experiment. We're told that the student investigated the effect of changing the concentration of sodium thiosulfate on the rate of the reaction. That's similar to the disappearing cross experiment and how it can be used. And we've shown a diagram for the apparatus. There is a light source shining light through the reaction mixture and then there is a light sensor the other side detecting the percentage of light that gets through. And we're told that a smaller percentage of light from the light source reaches the light sensor as the mixture becomes more cloudy. And here is the method that they used. They added 50 cm cubed of 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution in the beaker. That's the concentration, that's the volume. And we add 10 cm cubed of hydrochloric acid to the sodium thiosulfate solution, immediately start the timer, record the percentage of light from the light source that reaches the light sensor every 20 seconds for 120 seconds. And then repeat steps one to four using 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution. So double the concentration. And so in a sense, this is exactly like the disappearing cross. You change the concentration, you change the temperature, and you see the rate at which that cross becomes obscured. The difference this time is as time passes, the percentage of light reaching the sensor decreases but it doesn't decrease at the same rate, at a constant rate. It decreases steeply at first, and then it decreases a little bit less, and then a little bit less, and then it levels out. It stops decreasing, and we can assume that the reaction is over. And then we're told that the percentage of light reaching the light sensor decreases by 1% when 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of sulfur is produced. And we've been commanded to determine the rate of reaction in moles per second for the production of sulfur at 30 seconds. And we're told that we should draw a tangent on figure two. When you calculate the rate of any reaction, you're always going to be doing the change in some quantity divided by time. That might be centimeters cubed of gas per second or mass of gas per second. On this occasion, we're going to be working out moles per second. And so from the graph, you can see that we've got percentage on the y-axis, not moles, but we do have seconds on the x-axis. In some cases, we're asked to work out the average rate of reaction, and that would be for a change in percentage divided by time. We've been asked for the rate at 30 seconds. And that means that we need to draw a tangent and they've prompted us that we need to do so here. So you do this by finding 30 seconds on the X axis, going up to the curve at that point and then drawing a tangent at that point. Now, tangents are straight lines. This graph is not straight line. This is a curve graph. But if we draw a straight line at 30 seconds, we can match the gradient of the graph at that time, but then 
the graph will curve, but our gradient will continue in a straight line. When you draw a tangent, my strong recommendation is that you always, if you can, extend the tangent to the two axes that we've been given, because that will make the use of that tangent much easier. And so you can see here I've drawn my tangent. It meets the curve at 30 seconds, but it continues in a straight line all the way to the x-axis and all the way back to the y-axis. And so now we've got our tangent, we need to work out the gradient of this tangent. And so on the y-axis, the value starts one line above 70, and each square is worth 2%. So it starts at 72%, and it goes all the way down to 0%. That's why I suggest you continue the tangent to the axes where possible, because that means our change in y is 72%. And the x-axis, well, it starts at zero on the x-axis and it goes all the way along to three little squares past 70. And each little square is again worth two. So it's gone to 76. So our change in x is 76. So our tangent is 72, the change in y, divided by 76, the change in x. And that gets us 0 0.947. Now, this value is the percentage of light per second, because I've divided percentage by seconds. But we've been asked to work out moles per second. And so that means that we need to convert percentage per second into moles per second by converting percentage into moles. Now, in the question, we were told that a change of 1% means that 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of sulphur has been produced. Now, our percentage hasn't quite changed that much. It's changed by just less than 1%. And so the moles of sulphur produced in that time will be just less than 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5. And we can actually calculate its value by taking that number of 0.947 and multiplying it by 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5. And then when we get that, we can get a value of 6.73 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per second. And then we're asked to explain why the rate of reaction changes between 0 and 60 seconds and answer in terms of concentration. Well, at the beginning of any reaction, the reactant particles will be in the highest concentration they will ever be during the reaction. When over time these particles collide with each other, they will get used up in this reaction and so the concentration of the reactants is going to decrease and therefore the frequency of successful collisions will also decrease and so the rate of reaction will slow down. And we do need to say that the rate of reaction will slow down because all they've asked us to do is explain why it changes. And so in a situation like this, we need to say what the change is. And you can tell that this is the case from the graph. The gradient is steepest at the beginning, which means that the rate of reaction is greatest at the beginning because those concentrations of the reactant are greatest. And then over time, the gradient decreases as that reactant concentration decreases and the concentration decreases some more and the gradient decreases some more. And so the rate of reaction decreases as time passes. The graph that we've been looking at shows the results for when the concentration of sodium thiosulfate was 0 0.10 moles per decimeter cubed concentration. And we're told that the sodium thiosulfate solution was in excess in the investigation. Then we're told that the line of best fit on this figure is horizontal between 80 and 120 seconds because the reaction stopped. And we're asked to explain why the reaction stopped. Well, when you've got a reaction between any two chemicals, one of them is likely to be present in a higher quantity than the other. And that is what being in excess means. That means we've got more than enough of it and it will not get used up in the reaction. And the other chemical is the limiting reactant. And that is the one that will get used up. And so if the sodium thiosulfate solution is in excess, then it's the hydrochloric acid, the other reactant, that is going to be used up. 
And if the hydrochloric acid is being used up, its concentration is going to go down to zero, and therefore the successful collision frequency is going to drop to zero. There will be zero successful collisions per second. And then we're asked to sketch a line on figure three to show the results that you would predict for 0 0.20 moles per decimeter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution. So in other words, double the concentration of sodium thiosulfate. Well, there's two marks for this. And for a situation like this, which is a really common question, there will be one mark for the gradient of the line that you draw and another mark for the finishing height that this reaction will curve and then flatten out at. And the gradient is determined by how fast this reaction is. So let's look at that first. If the concentration is twice as big, the frequency of successful collisions will be twice the number and therefore the gradient will be twice as steep because the rate of reaction will be twice as fast. Now, for a question like this, they don't need the gradient to be precisely twice as steep. They actually just need it to start at the same place and to be steeper than the original line. And then we need to think about how much we're going to end up dropping that percentage to in the end. Well, all we're changing is the concentration of sodium thiosulfate. And sodium thiosulfate is already present in excess. So adding more of it is not actually going to reduce the percentage by any more than the original experiment did because that hydrochloric acid is still going to be used up. And it's the hydrochloric acid that determines how much sulfur we produce, so how much cloudiness there is. And so all that will happen is that that hydrochloric acid will end up getting used up faster, but we're going to flatten our line out at the same position. It still needs to finish at 24%. It needs to level off at 24% and be steeper than the original line. One mark for each of those features. The student did the experiment again the next day and they found that the same method produced different results for the percentage of light reaching the sensor. How could the student improve the method so that the same percentages of light reach the light sensor? That means the same percentages on those two days that they did the experiment on. So we've got the option of recording the percentage of light every 10 seconds. That's not the right answer. That will just give us a better idea about how our curve curves as time goes on. So it will improve the experiment, but not in the way that we're being asked to do here. Stop light from other sources reaching the light sensor. That's the correct answer because if it's a sunnier day, there might be more ambient light. That means there might be more light coming in through the windows and interfering with this experiment, and light from outside might be reaching this sensor and elevating the percentage of light greater than it should have been and greater than it would have been on a cloudy day. If we use a larger volume of sodium thiosulfate, that would just increase the volume here, and that wouldn't affect the light getting through. And then we could also say that using a more sensitive light sensor, assuming that we use the more sensitive light sensor on both days, that's not going to make any difference. It's the changes from one day to the next that is going to affect these variations. The students improved the method so that similar results were obtained on different days. What name is given to similar results obtained on different days under the same conditions by the same student? We're ticking one box here for one mark. Anomalous? That's not the right answer. An anomalous result means an odd result that doesn't fit in with the expected pattern, and that could be for a number of reasons. Precise? No, that's how close our values are together. And so that means that maybe we did the same thing multiple times and we got the same number each time. Repeatable is the correct answer. Repeatable means literally the same person did the same experiment and got the same results each time. Reproducible, that's if a different person repeated the experiment and got the same results on different occasions. And so reproducible and repeatable, they're really similar. Repeatable is for the same person doing it multiple times. Reproducible is more than one person doing the same thing and getting the same results.
And then we're shown a new graph which has got the volume of the two different reactants in this experiment on the x-axis and the mass of sulfur that has been produced on the y-axis. And this dashed line, that is for sodium thiosulfate, as per the key, and then the solid line, that is for the hydrochloric acid. And we're being asked which expression from the options below shows the relationship between the volume of sodium thiosulfate solution, so the dashed line, and the mass of sulfur produced, and that is the y-axis. And so as the volume of sodium thiosulfate increases, that's this line here, you can see that the value on the y-axis also increases. And it doesn't just increase, it's actually directly proportional because it's a straight line that goes from the origins, from 0, 0. And that means that the first answer is the correct answer. The volume is directly proportional to the mass produced. And our final question is to determine the simplest whole number ratio of the volumes of sodium thiosulfate to hydrochloric acid, which completely react with each other. That's really important. The fact that they completely react with each other means that they will be producing a specific mass of sulfur in grams. Now, actually, it doesn't matter what mass of sulfur you choose to produce. It just matters that you are producing a specific amount. And so, really, you could use any mass you like, and you would just need to read across and find out what volume of sodium thiosulfate was required to make that mass and what volume of hydrochloric acid was required to make that particular mass of sulfur. And so, the trick here, I think, is to find a place where, when you read across you meet a minor grid line at the point that the line crosses it. So, for instance, here, at 0 0.35 grams of sulfur being produced, when we read across, we find out that the sodium thiosulfate is on this minor grid line here, one little square past 100. So that means 110 cm cubed of sodium thiosulfate was required to make 0.35 grams of sulfur. And if we continue reading along this line further, we get to a point on the hydrochloric acid line that is also on a minor grid line. That is one small square before 450. And so that means 440 cm cubed of hydrochloric acid was required to make that particular mass of sulfur. And so you'll get your first mark of the three for choosing a point on your graph that you can use readily and for marking on it. It's really important to annotate your graph to show that you are using figure four as the question demands that you do. And then we have to turn this volume ratio into the simplest whole number ratio. And when you're simplifying a ratio, you might be able to do this by inspection, but you can't rely on that. And so the strategy I suggest you employ is to divide both of the numbers by the smallest of the two. And the smallest of the two here is 110. So 110 divided by 110 is, of course, 1. 440 divided by 110 is 4. And so therefore, the simplest whole number ratio is 1 to 4.